think about what's next for here and a little bit of resources. My PowerPoint has a whole list, and you'll see, um, of different local resources and national resources, as well as different things to read. Um, that I'm going to give Holly my uh, he have a, a copy of the PowerPoint so that y'all can just kind of easily access through that soft copy rather than I don't have like lists of them on a hard copy, which we can, we can make if you'd like to. But that's basically what it's going to look like today. I'm going to zip through things um, and and leave some time at the end for questions. Okay, so. Does that sound good to everybody? Yeah. Yep. Yeah? All right. All right. So the first thing I want to mention as I was thinking about coming up here, because most of my trainings, again, are really focused on, they're focused on LGBT work, but they're focused towards a certain group of people, so educators or mental health folks or medical folks. Or, and so this is, this is a very general kind of thing um, starting out doing this training here. But usually I will start out talking about how we we like to talk about LGBT as like this one kind of group of people. <coughs> but really, we are part of all the communities everywhere, right? Because it's just a diverse population. And so if you click one more time, <coughs> you're gonna actually want to keep on clicking okay. until you see the word sexuality pop up. Oh, okay. So Audre Lorde has this famous quote, there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we don't live single issue lives, right? So all of us have multiple identities. All these things that are kind of popping up here, um, they all affect and inform basically who we are, right? And lots of, and these are, this is not a comprehensive list, right? Of the way we grew up, our family structure, where our grandparents are from, what language we speak, whether we have disabilities or not, like all of these things kind of, they're all make us who we are. And today I'm going to be focusing on gender and sexuality, but even those things are all informed by all of these things, right? There's a lot of different parts of who we are. And I don't want that to get lost in when I'm talking about gender and sexuality, right? Because it's, well, we, we end up doing these trainings and really thinking of them as like these two very separate things. And especially when we talk about the community, the community as LGBT feels so separate from H, which, which might be heterosexual, right? Like, we're all together in this. We all have sexualities, we all have genders. And that's really where I'm coming from, from the start tonight. Does that make sense with everybody? Okay, thank you. <laughs> all right. So, for the next couple minutes, I'm gonna talk a little bit about terminology. And I really want to encourage you to write down your questions as they come up, as I go through some of the terms, um, because we will get them to them later for sure. Okay? And then if we don't get to them later, at least you'll have them if we need to come back and do another thing, or I can send you some resources so you can find definitions or explanations for some of the different terms. So what we're talking about, I'm going to start with the broad kind of terms, which is sets as far as anatomy and things like that gender and gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. So next slide, please. So starting off with talking about sex, or, or kind of gender biology, because sex and gender, or gender identity, are different things, even though we often hear them kind of interchangeably, right? Like when you're filling out a form, you usually see they ask gender, and it's male, female. That's yeah. usually on there, right? Yeah. But really, really, what they're asking is for is for sex. What sex were you assigned at birth by a doctor? And that's the way we use the term sex. So it really refers to specific anatomy, because when a doctor looks at a baby, right, they're looking at genitalia, basically, to decide if this baby is either a male or a female, or intersex, which a lot of you might not have heard the term intersex, but about one in 2,000 births, are babies that are born with different, kind of different types of genitalia, either internally or externally. Right? So one in 2,000 births is actually about the number of redheads in the US. So it sounds like it's 
you know, small, but it's, it's not really, right? The thing is that they're still really trying to understand more and more about, because it has to do with genetics and DNA, and I could do hours on just intersexuality, right? On, on the diversity of the human body when it comes to that. But again, talking about sex or sex assigned at birth, which is another kind of terms you might have heard already or phrase that people have talked about, that's what we're talking about, like the physical body, right? So we're used to hearing fe female, male, or intersex. Okay, next slide. Now, sex is different from gender identity. So now we're talking about gender identity, which is an internal sense of knowing who you are, whether it's man or a woman, transgender, both, neither, something totally different, right? And this, is, this kind of goes under the T part of LGBT. Gender identity, we really, we don't think of it a lot because we're mostly thinking male, female, male, female, right? But everybody has a gender identity because everybody really knows in their brain, right? If they feel like a man, they feel like a woman, they feel like something other than a man or a woman, maybe a combination or not at all. So there's a lot of different ways that we can understand our gender. Right? So a couple, some of the ways to think about it are listed up there. So woman, female, girl is one type of gender identity. Another is male or man, a boy. And then transgender, non-binary, and the GNC is gender non-conforming. There's a lot of words, right? There's a, we, we, hear, we say LGBT and LGBTQ. And we add sometimes in the straight and cisgender people, which I'll, I'll define those as well. Right. The one thing I want to say as I'm getting into this is while it's important, it's important to understand these kind of bigger pieces, these overview words that I'm talking about, but as we start to dig into more of the specific terminology, it might feel overwhelming right? and hard to remember and a little like, oh my goodness, <laughs> I can't. I'm never going to remember this. I don't even, I don't even get it. <clears throat> I don't want you to get hung up on remembering every definition of every word that I say here. Right? All the terms, all the LGBTQIAMP, like it goes on and on. Don't worry about right now really remembering all that. Because the bottom line is what we're trying to get to is a comfort level where we can just see each other as humans and talk to each other as humans, right? And language helps us do that. So I can have, explain, I have some words that I can use to explain one or two certain pieces of who I am to you, but really, I would like you to get to know me as a human being, aside from or along with of those few identities that I have. Because they're important, they, do, they impact my life a lot, but so do a lot of other things, right? So thinking from big to small, don't get, don't get too hung up on, on the words. It's important to have a general idea, but don't freak out about trying to remember everything. Because they're changing, the other thing is everything's changing all the time. Um, a lot of the youth are actually just adding new words to how they identify. Which is great, because young people have always kind of pushed us to, to think more expansively, which is wonderful. And it sometimes is hard to keep up. Right? OK. Breathe. How are we doing so far? OK. So side notes, this slide. I'm going into a couple other definitions that, are, that all go under gender identity. So transgender is a term that you probably heard. Again, it's the T in LGBT. And, and it's a, used still right now as an umbrella term for anybody who basically they were assigned a certain sex at birth, remember male or female usually, but they don't in their brain they know that their gender is different than the, the sex they were assigned at birth. Okay, so that's one of the umbrella terms. There are a lot of different ways that transgender people or different words that transgender people use to describe their gender identity. So they might not say I'm transgender. They might say that they're gender queer or gender fluid or non-binary or there's a lot of these other words that kind of fall under that umbrella of that word. Okay. And then cisgender is somewhat of a newer word. Has anybody ever heard of this term before? 
couple people. Okay. So cisgender just means you're not transgender, which means you basically, if the doctor said you're a man or you're a boy, signed you boy at birth, and you feel like a boy or a man, you're cisgender. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. It's basically CIS is a word from chemistry which means along the same side. That's what the prefix CIS is. And trans, as you probably know, is going across. Right? So when you think about somebody who was assigned male at birth but might feel more like a woman, it's kind of crossing as trans. And then cis is you were assigned female at birth and you feel like a female, you're along the same side. That's one way to kind of picture it. Um, and then, and again, like I mentioned, so a lot of individuals who will use different terms to describe who they are to you. And coming from my professional background of working with young people, again, how words will, they would, they would come into groups and tell us, like, my name is this now, or I'm using these words now, maybe sometimes different every week, right? And my job was to listen to them. And, and to just hear what they were telling me. It was not for me to tell them who they were or who they are, right? And it's really not anybody's job to tell anybody about who they are because we know who we are. You know, we are the best, like, knowers of our own selves outside of anybody else. So that's why I have that up there. It's, it's self-identification. All of these terms and these things that we're talking about People will say, hey, I'm transgender, or I'm queer, or I'm this, or I'm that, and you might have a sense internally of like, mm, I don't think that's right, or I don't think you're right, or are you sure? Or with young people, it's like, is it a phase? I don't know, you're too young to know, right? Um, but everybody knows themselves, and again, in my experience, especially kids, know themselves really well, and adults don't do the greatest job of listening to them. So anyway, that's that little bit. So that's what this slide is. It's kind of a couple of extra terms that fall under gender identity. Okay. Next kind of overall kind of larger concept is gender expression. Right? So gender expression is just how we present ourselves as our gender. Right? So we have these words that we describe. So there's a feminine kind of gender. There's things we call feminine. Right? that are the way we express ourselves, and there's things we call masculine, and then there's maybe a mixture, right? So clothing, hairstyle, mannerisms, um, sometimes hobbies or things that people are interested in, these are all things that we've decided should be masculine or feminine, which is kind of random, but it's centuries of, you know, or really, I won't say centuries, because things have shifted throughout the centuries, right? You think about centuries ago, men wore dresses, right? But things change, and the fashion industry actually has a lot of a lot of influence on us that we don't even think about. Because if you think, here's an example: so pink and blue, right? We've always thought, well, we think of blue as the boy color, and pink as the girl color, right? About 50 years ago, pink was the was the boy color, and blue was the girl color a little over 50 years, and then things started to shift from the fashion industry kind of shifting things a little bit of like making pink more feminine, right? And we all just kind of go along with that for the most part. But, it, but bottom line is they're just colors, actually, right? They don't really have a gender. Toys are just toys. Toys don't have a gender, right? Like they're just things. They're just materials. And so... Gender expression is really interesting, though, because it's intense, right? The way that we're conditioned to really feel like, if I'm a girl, I should like dresses, right? Or I should like dolls, and I should want to do this. And if I'm a boy, or I was told I was a boy, I'm supposed to really only like trucks, and I wear blue stuff, and I want to play football. Like, and, that, and those are our kind of limiting norms, um, but they're pretty strong when you think about the pressure that we put on each other and on our kids to fit into these kind of gender norms that part of them are expression, okay? But that's just a, the larger framework. And I mention this because I have up here fluid, and we have gender queer, gender fluid, androgynous, right? 
So within the LGBT community, and actually with some people who identify as straight or heterosexual or cisgender, right, their gender expression is actually just being creative. Right? It kind of shows our creativity, and so some people might mix it up, right? Mixing it up might be me wearing nail polish right now. Like, I'm not wearing any right now, but if I wear nail polish and tie, right? We think of ties as man things, we think of nail polish as girl things. And again, they're just things, but that would look like mixing it up a little bit, right? Those are both just expressions of gender. When we look at each other mostly, we, we make assumptions based on how we look. And the first thing that really registers in our brain is male, female. And then we start looking at body type and size and skin color and things like that. Right? And studies have been done on this. And then all of our brain get flooded with the messages that we've been told about girls who have lighter skin and blonde hair and are tall and have this body shape. And it's unconscious, a lot of it, or subconscious, but all of the, you know, the stereotypes kind of flood in, right? Just by looking at somebody that you don't even know, you have no idea, so we start making assumptions. It's just a human thing, right? Before we've even talked to the person, before we know anything about them, we already have kind of this sense of, like, we think we know who they are. Right? We all do. And so one of the things that I like to kind of keep weaving in and out of, of my talks is to do the work of not making the assumptions. And I'm part of that, because I'm making assumptions about everybody in the room right now, too. You know, based on like how you're dressed and how you look and, you know, like tall or short, blah, blah, blah. Like I'm, I am, because that's just what we do. But what I'm going to do is check, check myself on that and try not to change the way I would normally act towards somebody. I'm not going to be more unkind or, you know, less kind or anything. You know, like, I want to see you as a human and know, I don't really know. I have all kinds of ideas back here, but I don't really know who you are. And I want to be able to have the openness to know who you are if you feel like you want to do that, right? Um, and again, this all kind of falls under how we express ourselves, and gender expression is a big piece of that. How are we doing? Good? Great. Still? Okay. All right, next slide. Okay, so this is just some examples of mixes of gender expression. And I don't know if you know some of these, I guess I pulled a lot generationally in my brain because I'm 40, and so I have a lot of people that I know. It's like, David Bowie and Nikki Pop and Janet Mock and Grace Jones and Ellen um, Prince. I can't remember the last two people there, but if you anybody watch Grey's Anatomy? Did you ever watch Grey's Anybody in Grey's Anatomy? It's kind no, of Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy. No, I watched it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, the, the, the woman with the yellow yeah, background, she's, she's Callie in Grey's Anatomy. She's also on uh, and she's Madam Secretary right now. Is she? Yeah, that's right. And then I think the person on the bottom right is, I think her name is Laura Grace. She's a punk, she's a trans woman who's also a punk rock um, musician. Kind of badass. Um, so anyway, so these are just just kind of a visual of different gender expressions, right? And, a, and most of these people have had a different type of sexuality or, or language that they might have used to describe their sexuality as well, other than heterosexual. Okay. All right, next slide. Okay, so my last kind of overall category is sexual orientation, which is totally different from sex, gender, and gender expression, right? Again, we all have a sexual orientation. Um, we all have a gender and a sex that we were assigned at birth. Sexual orientation are, simply put, our feelings of attractions toward, toward people outside of us, if we have feelings of attraction, because some people don't, right? But it's not based on behavior. It's based on feelings. And so some of the language that people use to describe their sexual orientation to somebody else is lesbian or gay. I put same gender loving up there. Bisexual, pansexual, asexual, queer, questioning, and heterosexual. Right? There are many other words that people will just use to describe their sexual orientation to people or to describe how they experience attraction towards folks. 
Um, but what we know is that it's very diverse. It, it's not just like people are gay or straight, right? There's a lot more of a mixture in there because we're, again, like the, young, the youth culture is really great because they're helping us think about attraction as much more than just physical or sexual, that we actually can get attracted to people just emotionally and romantically, but maybe not completely physically, or maybe it's more kind of a spiritual connection that's stronger than it is as, as it might be as a sexual connection, but it's still an attraction and a connection. So they're creating language to describe that, that experience, right? And again, we don't want to get lost into the bazillion words that they use, but it does speak to the fact that we are dynamic human beings. We're not just how we think of gay and straight, right? Um, one thing I'd like to do to kind of help people understand sexual orientation and how we get it, how we kind of start to understand it within ourselves, is if you think back to if you had a crush when you were young, about how old were you? Do you remember your first crush, anybody? How old were you? Oh, probably 10. Uh -huh. His name was Pierre Chaldu. <laughs> I, I still remember his name. Yeah. You're yeah. very precocious, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> totally, so 10. Anybody else willing to share? Do you remember? Uh, mine was also 10. Uh -huh. And I married him 40 years later. Wow. Nice. <laughs> when you were 14? No. 40 no. years. Oh, 40, <laughs> 40 years later. 40 years later. My, I met my husband when I was 10. That's oh, okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Nice. Anybody else? Think, can you think or even remember the grade or if you had it? I, I would say I was uh, probably 11 or 12, and I still remember that person's name, Yeah. which shall remain nameless. But <laughs> <laughs> totally keep your confidentiality. Yeah. Roy Rogers doesn't count, does it? Sure. It, does. Like, it does in when you hear my next question. Any type of sense that you like, I have a crush on. It could have been a real person, it could be a person on TV, it could be a cartoon character, yeah. graphic novel person. Yeah. I was seriously um, jealous of Dale Evans. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted Superman to take my hand and fly me away. Yeah, me too. <laughs> But, you know, Lois, Lois. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rick. <laughs> He's shaking his head at me. He thinks I'm a crazy person. <laughs> Here's the thing. So, it, so young, usually, right? We kind of have a sense. Now, how did you know that that was a crush happening and not just a friend, right? What was the difference? How did you know? I lost my mind. You lost it. <laughs> and how? Like, how would you well, describe it? I went it? from being confident and and not worried about what I said or did or how I looked or anything, and all of a sudden, appearances became important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially in front of that person. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah. I don't know, you might be, I mean, aside from the sexual attraction, you might be really interested in the person as a whole, about what they, you know, who they are. Yeah, you like might want be to like find a teacher, out more. I like had a teacher that I just Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that happens a lot, kind of getting a crush on somebody. So you want to spend time with them, and kind of get to know them maybe more than you care about some friends, right? right? What else kind of happens when you know you're crushing on somebody, when you have that first crush? I imagine you're preoccupied with thinking of that person. Mm -hmm. Fantasy. Mm -hmm. Fantasies. Even just as simple as the physical feel, like having butterflies in your stomach or being nervous around that person, maybe, mm -hmm. right? There's like, we just kind of know. We know that there's something about that person that's different than like the, the friends we have that we might love our friends, but this person is there's something different, right? That's the kind of understanding or very oversimplified way to understand like that's sexual orientation that's starting to get a sense of who you're attracted to 
but really what characteristics of a person that you are attracted to. Okay? So we don't talk about it a lot as characteristics. We are used to talking about if your sexual orientation, it's like you're this boy who likes this girl. Or maybe we're, you're this boy and you like this boy. Or you're this girl and you like this girl. Right? But it's actually a lot more than that because if you, you know, Lois, you liked boys. Yes. Right? Yes. Did you like every boy you ever no. met? No. no. Probably not, right? <laughs> no. Why? No. It depends on the person, right? There right. are certain characteristics or right. things that you liked. Right. That's, that's really what sexual orientation is. It's getting an understanding of what do, what do I like in a person, right? And though maybe it's always other, maybe it's boys or maybe it's girls or maybe it's trans people at this point, which a lot of kids are understanding, their identities are really, they're attracted to people of all different types of genders. Right? So they're using different language to describe that. But really what they're seeing is, I'm really attracted to this kind of person. Right? The problem is, because as we're, I'm talking about it this way right now, which feels very kind of light and fun and it's easy to kind of understand it that way, I think. But the discrimination and the harassment and the bullying in the schools and the laws that we have across the country that actually like cause so much harm based on being outside of what is considered the norm, which is heterosexuality, right? And being cisgender. If you're outside those norms, a lot of us really, we struggle because of those policies and the laws and the, just some of the stigma that's still out there about having any other kind of identity besides being heterosexual or straight or cisgender. Right? And so hopefully we can have more conversations this way where it's like, Yes, there's sexual orientation. Everybody has a sexual orientation. And really, it's about different kinds of people. It's not only about being attracted to a specific gender. Okay. My vision is like one day we're, we're probably not even talking about any of this at some point because we're just, people just get to be people and, and hopefully have healthy, respectful, caring relationships with other people, bottom line. Okay. And that kids and people attract that to themselves as well. But alas, we're here, I have words <laughs> that are really wrapped up in gender, because lesbian is a term that means a woman who is attracted to other women, right? Again, it has, it's about gender, but that's, that, that's the word we use right now, and that's what some words, be, some people will choose to use the word lesbian to describe their sexual orientation, right? Same thing with gay, gay is usually a term that folks are used to hearing, like a man who's attracted to another man. But a woman, some women use the term gay as well, right? Because they don't like the word lesbian. Um, same gender loving is actually a term that's come mostly from the African American community because the terms lesbian and gay are very white. You know, they've kind of come from white culture and they don't, it, had to, it doesn't really fit um, for some folks in the African American community. Lesbian and gay are not words that they've wanted to use. So they've termed one of the terms that some folks in the African American community will use the same gender level. Bisexual is if you're attracted to both, both genders, right? Bi means two. Um, and some people who identify or use the term bisexual will actually use it and define it as I'm attracted to two genders, two different genders, and not meaning just male, female, but meaning Mass male people and transgender male people, right, or, or something like that, right? It's two genders, but not making it just male and female. Pansexual, I put it next to bisexual because it's very similar in definition, but it means generally that people are not, people who will use the term pansexual, from what I've heard, is that they're not worried about a person's gender. They're not looking at gender as who they're attracted to. They're just attracted to that person. So pansexual, again, the uh, prefix pan, right? Kind of like a panoramic camera, just a wide view. I'm just attracted to a person, I'm not worried about gender. Asexuality, um, somebody who doesn't really experience strong physical attraction or emotional attraction to people, right? Um, it doesn't mean that they're folks who are like hermits and they never relate with anybody. They just don't feel these strong sense of attraction towards people in that way. Um, queer is another kind of over, um, like, umbrella term 
that a lot of younger people have used. It's still a term that can be used in a very derogatory way, clearly, right? But it's also a term that's been taken back as a more empowering word to say, I'm not heterosexual or I'm not cisgender too. So it's, it's got a lot of different meaning to it. Questioning is, is used as kind of as a, you know, a legitimate place where people are when they're kind of questioning what words to describe their experience in the world of their attraction or their gender, right? So it can kind of fit under both. And then heterosexual is if you're, you know, assigned male and you're attracted to women who are assigned female and it's kind of a, the main normative word that we're used to hearing. Okay. Lots of words, lots of things. How are we doing? Fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's go to the next slide. All right. So a little bit of a quick self-reflection I would like everyone to do. It looks like most people have some paper. If you don't, maybe we can get you some paper and a pen. Um, I have some questions that I'm going to throw up on the next slide that I want to encourage you just, this is not a like you have to talk to somebody else about it, but I want you to consider these questions and maybe just either jot down answers or draw a picture or make a squiggle or whatever you want to do. I'm not going to be real hard and fast about this, but answer these questions and write something down so it kind of connects brain to hand on the paper. Okay? And I'm going to give you about like three minutes or so. So you don't have to, don't overthink it, right? Don't go too much into it, but I just wanted you to reflect a little bit. Does anybody have something? Cool. Okay, so next slide has the questions. So just take a couple of minutes to think through these. How did you identify or how did you think of your sexual orientation when you were a teenager as compared to now? And how did you identify your gender when you were a teen? Or how did you think about it? Or did you think about it when you were a teenager? And do you think about it now? What has changed since you were young about your understanding of both gender and sexual orientation? And then in what ways do you think people stereotype or make assumptions about you? based on those two types of identity, and try to think of at least one. If you can't, don't stress about it, but just put a little bit of thought into that, and I'll let you take a couple minutes to, to do that.
What are you looking at, Lois? I'm drawing a picture. <laughs> I want to see. It's a penis. <laughs> oh, I didn't learn to say that word till I was about 50. <laughs> the great enlightening began. So I bring up these questions because I think it's, again, it's really important for all of us to reflect on our own identities and not be thinking so much about othering everybody else. We're really kind of focusing on ourselves sometimes because especially if you're somebody who has, for most of your life or all of your life, identified as heterosexual or just thought of yourself as like kind of the norm, you're heterosexual and you're cisgender, right? And you haven't had to think a lot about what it might be like to be somebody who doesn't feel that way. Um, so I wonder if I could get, we don't have to worry about the first two questions, we keep that confidential, I wonder if anybody would be, would be willing to share a little bit of your experience, and we won't go on too long because I want to make sure that we can move on to the next thing, but what has changed since you were young? And if you're willing to share any of the like the assumptions or stereotypes that people put on you. Anybody willing to share? Yeah, I think, you know, since I was Young, there's a lot more openness now, which is really nice, and people being a lot more sensitive. And um, you know, it's not something that you whisper about or that's gossipy or or something like that. It's just open. There's so much more openness and acceptance and understanding. Yeah, than when you were young. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um. I become aware of how what I would say how wonderfully multidimensional it is. And when I was young, I probably didn't have young enough. I didn't have any idea. It was there was boys in the, the men to parents and girls and their mothers. And then you know maybe there was a gay guy or something. And then um, I'm not really sure I know how many dimensions there are now. <laughs> okay, maybe there's, okay. And I just think it's. I mean that I think has um, become much more common that people understand the diversity and. You didn't understand there was diversity, right? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm not sure oh, Rick's gonna kill me. Uh, when I was a teenager, I was very well built. Let's put it that way. I had a girlfriend who said to me, "You should never wear a sweater." Okay, but then I had guys who liked the sweater look. And it was like, it was about my chest, not about me. Is that? Which not much has changed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, um, it's, you know, I look at these long-legged women and you know, that's the way you're supposed to look, and I've never looked that way. I've never felt grown up because I'm about this tall. So, anyway, that's... Sorry, Rick. <laughs> Why do you apologize for Rick? <laughs> oh! That's an inside thing. We don't even... It's just... It's an inside thing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing with us. Let's go, Holly. Well, I was just going to say, when I was younger, I, the thing was to be just like everybody else. I mean, if you wore something different, you know, you were teased and that sort of thing. I don't think it's that way at all anymore. I love to do things that are different and step out of the box and, and you know, wear a tie, if I feel like. Yeah. So that's <laughs> changed for you yeah. as you've grown up. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I was going to say, it's still the same for kids. Is it still the same for yeah, kids? They have the all the peer the pressure same? and follow the things. Oh, okay. Even within the subgroups of queer community, you know, like there's pressure to be a certain way. 
there's pressure to be trans enough. Which is <laughs> mm -hmm. sad and scary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But right, as we get older, we can often hopefully find a place where we're like, screw all that, right? I'm going to be me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was kind of my thing with the last question. I had a hard time answering that one because I think my sexual orientation and gender identity would be one of the last things that someone's stereotyping me for. I feel like it's all of those other things mm -hmm. that people are typically passing stereotypes more yeah. quickly. Yeah, what, what other things? I mean, like, just like, if you're blonde, if your skin's a certain color, if you're dressing like the cool kids, or if you're choosing to dress differently. Right. Like, I think those are kind of some of the things that... I Which would I choose. would say relate to gender. Gender, right, gender expression, if we put it all together. Yeah. Some of the clothing stuff, right? It all falls under whether you're feminine enough, right? If you look feminine enough. Um, I guess some of those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Probably. Some right. people right. think if you're blonde, you're not very smart. Yeah. I've so, experienced that. <laughs> yeah, Margaret. Yeah, and, and being the early bloomer, I was this tall when I was 12. And that was very weird to have people respond to me as a 12-year-old as if I were a 21-year-old. Right. That was just creepy. Just just <laughs> so you were buying beer for all the kids. <laughs> no, because I was kind of a tomboy, and I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to just I wanted to go climb trees and play in the creek. Didn't so. Yeah, it was being being not only um, the stereotype of the blonde bimbo, if you will, the bucks bucks and blonde <laughs> bimbo, bimbo yeah. but being very mature physically at twelve. Right. It's very off. Right. And to think about that is the again, if you think about it, and I want to encourage you to continue as you go on the rest of your days, you can nail a lot of this right to your gender norms and expressions when you dig into it a little bit. Because mm -hmm. think of it in, the, in a flip way. If you were a boy, mm -hmm. which I'm assuming, I'm making an assumption that you you identify as a woman, as a cisgender woman. If you were assigned male at birth, how would it be different if you were tall and blonde at 12? That's the difference. It makes a big it difference. Makes a big difference, it right? Be. Why aren't you a tall boy football? versus being a short boy, mm -hmm. right? Like, big difference. so difference. many things. Right, affect all of that. Uh, another thing that I think is kind of a reflecting on gender identities, gender stereotypes, orientation stereotypes. In my like before I was twelve, I think I had met probably seven or eight people or and, and couples who were same gender loving. Mm -hmm. I like that term. And as a kid, I just thought it seemed like a really normal thing. And it didn't like pop out of my head as, oh, what's going on with Hildegard and Pete? There was like, of course they're a couple. It was so obvious, it was so natural, and I didn't think anything of it until somebody else was like, oh, do you know, they're like, you know, whisper, whisper. It's like, well, that's weird. So I, I've had several episodes of that in my life thinking, Wow, I'm the only one who thought that was perfectly normal. If you're yeah. from Nebraska and my age, you don't think anything's normal. Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, and that kind of speaks to, like, right, differences, again, ge geography, where we grew up, where we live now, where, you know, all the different things, right, it affects, yeah. like, how we think and how we see the world. And I thank you all for kind of sharing, kind of, this is a conversation that I would love to just continue just on this alone. Um, it's really eye-opening. And like for me as somebody, so I identify as a queer transgender man. And so I've done a lot of thinking, especially because I do these trainings, on what gender means, how it feels, what it means to walk around in the world, with the way that you feel about your gender inside, and the way you look, and what feels right. There's so much rich information here and so much to kind of open us up to really it liberates everybody when we start kind of breaking it down. Because I have so much of a better chance. So I was assigned female at birth. I didn't transition to male until I was 38. So the whole first half of my life I was conditioned and social, socialized as a woman. 
and now I'm walking through the world in a package that looks like a man. And yet, I still have a lot of woman inside of me, because that's how I grew up, too. But I'm seeing a, the world, the male world, I feel a little bit like a spy, because I hear things that I wasn't hearing before, right, in just male spaces. And I feel the different pressures, and I can, like, I have a lot more just personal empathy for what it means to be a man in the world than I did before. Um, and so it's just really interesting. I think that there's actually a lot that we can learn from transgender people and non-binary people because especially if we transition to older, we really have lived in the world in these certain kind of ways. And I'm a binary looking trans guy, right? There's non-binary people who their gender expression is not looking like me, right? Um, we're much more, com people are much more comfortable with me in the way that I look than they might be with if, if I came in in a skirt and nail polish and some more feminine stuff, right? And a beard, right? And, that, and people did express their gender that way, right? And they should, right? We want people to be able to just be who they are, ideally, without having to deal with discrimination and harassment and stigma in the world. But it, it comes from us as individuals inside to be able to get comfortable enough with our own stuff to really hold the space and just let people be whoever they are, right? Even if it makes us uncomfortable the way that they look. And I've had that experience where I'll see somebody who's not binary identified who uses pronoun, we didn't even get to this pronoun stuff, um, you know, people using pronouns other than he or she where they look very masculine to me but they want to use the, the she pronoun so they feel like a, more like a woman. It takes a lot of work on my part to get used to that. But that's my job. It's not their job to change. It's not their job to look the way that I makes me feel comfortable. That's not their responsibility. Right? So again, this is something we could go into forever. And I didn't leave you a whole lot of time for questions, but I do we want to take at least a, a couple, if anybody has one. That would probably take a really long time to answer, but we'll see where we go. And then I do want to encourage folks to think about what you might want to do next. Let's take one question. Uh, I, I just want to expand on the, on the first quote from Audrey Lord. Yeah. I think I get it, but it's, it said, no such thing as a single issue is struggle because we don't live single issue lives. Could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So, so for example, when I'm talking about my gender, as I'm a transgender man, that's one issue, right? But then when I say queer, I'm talking about my sexual orientation, which is who I'm attracted to. That's another issue. I'm a white guy who grew up middle class in New York. That's like two or three more issues, right? So talking about basically gender, sexuality, race, class, ability, all those things are different issues that we all carry, all those things are me, right? Whereas when when I come here to talk about LGBT people. Well, like gender expression and all, all these things. All those things all, are different all issues, issues yeah. totally. Okay. And so we think about it as one, you know, when I come to a training on LGBT stuff, that's one, one issue, but it's actually more, right? Okay. And it brings a whole lot more. So it's important to talk about that to start to talk about how people are multidimensional, and that's what she was saying. Yeah. Okay, last thing, just as thoughts that anybody wants to share as far as next steps for here. What would you like to see happen as far as like more training, other discussions, do you want more resources? What would you like, what do you think? as far as the district goes, or what would be helpful from having this start? Is there any way to go down as in individuals and take additional the offer? I know I, there's also nonviolent communication, which I've been going to. And, uh, um, do you offer like side seminars like they with what they do? Or they, I haven't done anything myself. I think the Diversity Center does do some community education nights. So it's, I have a lot of information from the Diversity Center that I brought with me. 
that's on the table that people can take to so you can get in touch with them about like kind of getting more going to more classes Just or go to like the community. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, right. Any la like a last comment or last thoughts that you want to share before well, we go? Well, thank you for being here and talking to. And I got to think about Pierre Shall do again. <laughs> <laughs> so Holly's handing out an evaluation that I can bring back to the diversity center about this. So it'd be great if we took just a couple minutes just to like four questions. You know what? You, they can uh, finish them up and give them back to me, and then I'll make sure they get to you. Okay. Because we have a 6:30 meeting to right. Holly. Okay. So. Yep. So that'd be great. So you want to bring them to Sharon? Because yeah. it's going to the diversity. Center. I will do that. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Well, thank you again for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Pleasure meeting you. Holly has her mic. Oh, she's got her mic. Holly has her contact information. I don't have any cards or anything, but if you had more questions or you wanted resources or anything, don't don't hesitate to email me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So. Okay, go get some water. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I don't feel very good, so I just want to be excused. Didn't look like a very long agenda anyway. Okay. Okay. <laughs> What's the matter? I can't find the person. I have to call the attorney and tell her to call us. You know what? There are some mysteries best left <laughs> unsolved. Actually, I saw Pierre at a, at a reunion. Wow. And he, his wife had died, and and he made a pass at me. And I wasn't interested. That's how I took it. Thank you for the call. Yeah. Okay, Tara's going to phone us now. Yeah, didn't we already? We're going to start this meeting. Uh, Bill wasn't feeling well. I don't know if he's coming back. Okay. Okay. So he may be back. I don't know. What? Yeah. Oh, it was medication he hadn't Hello? taken for yeah, blood pressure. Yeah, okay, Okay, good. Thank you. Um, we're just getting ready to start our meeting now. So, um, Gina can't be here, so we oh. have Tara Paul from Nossaman on the phone. All right. We hope we don't put you to sleep, or maybe it'd be a good idea if we did put you to sleep. <laughs> I'll, I'll be diligently awake following along. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we've already had roll call. Do we need to have roll call again? Yes, we'll have roll call again. Yeah, okay. Okay, Director Smallman is absent. Director Bruce? Here. Director Swan? Here. President Henry? Here. Director Pulse? Here. Okay, we're all here. Uh, Bill may be back, I don't know. Uh, anyway, I wanna welcome all of you. I'm so happy to see you. Uh, and 
I'm glad it's not raining tonight so far. Um, so we'll have public comment next. You may speak for five minutes about anything that's not on the agenda. And it should kind of pertain to the water district. I, 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 I guess you could talk about the glaciers disappearing or something, but it'd be kind of water. So is there anybody out there who would like to speak? Rick? Yes, thank you, Lord. Um, <laughs> my name is Rick Moran from Den Lomas. Uh Since the board has approved using action minutes, it is, for me at least, a lot easier to understand what has taken place during the meetings. So I thank you for changing that format. Um, also, uh, during reading that, uh, I read a lot of it, um, and I have read uh, a lot of minutes before. Uh, I would like to know what, how informational material is chosen. So it's usually down at the bottom of the agenda. And uh, like this week, there's a couple of newspaper stories. Um, and it doesn't really you know, reflect well on our district up here. But um, recently, uh, there was a front page story in the January 25th press banner. I have it here, January 25th and how the San Lorenzo Valley Water District banned glyphosate permanently, okay? And um, um, that was not included in informational material. So I don't know if it's newspaper stories they could put in there or how they're chosen, what reference they need to be. Uh, so here is a, this is a good news story, all right, that a lot of people worked hard to achieve. Uh, I'm in contact with uh, two authors, um, Dow Ryan, who is a scientist and a uh, local resident, uh, went to school at UCSC, she wrote this book, Beyond the War of Invasive Species, and I'm also in contact with Carrie Gillum, author of Whitewash, the story of a weed killer, cancer, and the corruption of science. And when I notified them about this story, they sent their congratulations. So those two authors would like to send their congratulations to this water district for doing that. And I would like that this article be put in the informational material as a permanent record of what we've achieved here. So that's my, uh, what I had to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else want to speak? Everybody's so quiet tonight. Okay. I, I, actually, I do. Uh, Chris White, the moment, and I just wanted to know if the board was ever going to take any action in moving from at-large elections to trustee area elections, because uh, the, the, the threshold for a violation of the CVRA, the California Voting Rights Act, is pretty low, and there are a lot of lawsuits coming through the courts in the last couple of years uh, regarding violations of CRVA, particularly around at-large elections. So I would hope that that would be something that the board would look at addressing. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Um, so are there, I guess I should have asked you this before, if there's any changes to the agenda or additions? Uh, none except I would excuse the director Smallman for illness from the meeting. Okay. All right. So I will go to unfinished business, which is a uh, 2016 strategic plan review, discussion and possible action. Do we do we want to make a motion to excuse oh, Mr. Smallman? Oh. Okay. I would move that we excuse Director Smallman on account of illness. Second. Consensus or consensus? Okay. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So back to unfinished business. <laughs> um, the strategic plan review. So anybody on the board? Want, or Rick, you want to? Well, back in February, we discussed, I brought to the board the existing uh, 
strategic plan that is 2016 strategic plan um, and brought it to the board to review and to talk about to, uh, moving forward with updating strategic plan since since it, uh, last time it was updated was 2016 and the majority of the board has changed. Um, in the past, we used uh, a gentleman, uh, Fred Ives, that worked on the first original strategic plan. He worked on uh, the second update, and he sent a proposal to uh, the district um, that he would be willing to come in and update um, the, this, the current strategic plan. Um, I did send out uh, a request uh, for pricing and information to two others. Did not receive anything back from either one of them. Um, we do have uh, 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 the, uh, the, uh, the uh, BHI benefit consulting proposal to update our strategic plan. It's a series of meetings. He comes down, uh, public involvement. That was from 2001. Uh, it was from uh, 2016. 14. 2014. 14, yeah. It's the same guy. It's the, the same guy. It's the same guy who's, who we did the original plan and did the up, last update. Right. Right. and not proposing to, to do this update. Um, his proposal is in the agenda. I think we are trying to find his About $8,000. Yeah, you know, we travel, it would be close to $10,000 out the door. Um, I think it's good to have someone come in and work with the board and staff. It's inter uh, individual interviews. Um, I think it's something that would be good that someone from the outside you know, works with the board and works through it and works with the public. Um, with that, I uh, no doubt that the board has questions or comments that they would probably like to discuss. Well, <clears throat> uh, as a credit union person, I hate to keep bringing that up, but we had to do strategic plans. We always had somebody come in and give us pointers on what we needed to do and, and help us out with that. And I think it's a lot for the board to take on because um, we have other things we need to be doing and we need to have a strategic plan so we can figure out where we're going with the budget for one thing, what our goals are, what we think has been done well, what we think hasn't been done well. Um, there's a lot of that's just very simple things in the strategic plan, but it can get more involved than that. Margaret? I'd like to second what uh, Lewis Henry had to say about that. I think it's a, a detailed and complex process, and it's great to have somebody who's a little impartial help us step through that process. Um, I have mixed feelings about Brent Ives. I think his familiarity with the district is a plus. Um, some of my more recent interactions with him at conferences make me wonder just how enthusiastic he is about working anymore. He's sort of like maybe more interested in playing golf, but nevertheless, um, he knows the district well. I like his process that he's proposed of interviewing staff, interviewing the board and key stakeholders and getting some of that perspective <coughs> and helping us synthesize all of that input I think is really helpful. So, um, sorry Rick that nobody else responded to your inquiries. I sent out to, to, to both of them and, and nothing back. And, and that he's responded says he's interested. So I, I would be in favor of using Brent Ives. He's interested, he knows us, the objectivity is helpful, and what you said. I don't have mixed feelings about Mr. X. Um, we've engaged with him before, and I find his work product to be very um, I'm not sure exactly the right word, pedestrian perhaps. When I reviewed the strategic plan that apparently he wrote, or at least wrote the bulk of uh, the 2016, mm -hmm. Well, it sounded like he wrote a good share of it. I don't know if he did then, but it was definitely not a plan that really had any meat to it. There were some goals, for example, that were, well, we're going to have the strategic goal to review something in a certain year. 
that's not what a strategic plan is all about. Um, I, I don't want to spend $8,800 or $10,000 on this, at least not at this point. Um, what I did do is I took it upon myself to start writing one based on the plan that we have in existence. And I should have a draft done by the next meeting. I... Um, and, and I have to tell you something. I find the notion of us not being the ones to do the Shadiki plan to be not a great thing. I think outsourcing it to a third party or um, asking somebody to come in uh, to write it for us or do a lot of work for us, I think is not what we should be doing. We're the ones that should be doing that work. Now, we can get a facilitator. That's fine. But I don't think that's $10,000 worth of, of work. I'd rather take that money and spend it elsewhere. So here's an issue. You can't really talk to us. I mean, you could talk to me, hmm? but you can't talk to us about district business. This would be you. It wouldn't be necessarily what other board members think is a good idea. Now, you could talk to staff, I assume. Um, so I, I, it's one thing for you to write the board policy manual, but I have a little bit of an issue with this. Well, it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be an, a be-all and end-all. It's a draft that people can say, we don't agree with any of it, and, or propose something new, or propose additions, or what have you. But it's not $10,000 that we're spending on a guy that I don't think does particularly good work. Okay. I would uh, be happy to find another guy. There are other facilitators that, yeah. SoCal, Santa Cruz, whoever, yeah. other water districts, other special districts may use. Frank Ives has a well-known name and a history with us, that said. I'm very uncomfortable with any one of us taking ownership of the document. It's not ownership. It's a level of engagement and and influence in the document that I think for any one of us is inappropriate. It's not governance, it's... This it's, is it's, our job. I disagree. Wordsmithing a document is not our job. Gathering... Cre creating the strategic plan is our job. Yes, but not, I'm gonna take dictation, not I'm gonna put my words in here and you guys can pitch them or keep them. We hire professionals. They're sitting across the table from me. We want to have them write it? We want to have them contribute to of it. Of course. That's part of the process. And I that's what we do here in a meeting. And, I, and, and, I, and perhaps a special workshop. And I don't think any one of us should have the ownership of writing the document. Do you have anything you want to say? Well, I think, uh, well, if I'm, so number one, I'm not keen on hearing about another uh, bid process where only one person bids on it. That's just got to stop. I don't care if we don't do a plan. You know, I, I just don't see any more single bid uh, proposals in, in, my, uh, in my span here. I just don't want to see that, period. I think Bob makes a great effort and a, a suggestion that Yes, it is the board's responsibility to come up and, along with the staff, develop a strategic plan. I don't know that any one of us is capable of doing that on our own. And like you say, I think it probably lends to a violation of the Brown Act if one of us were to try to write it and consult with the other board members on any part of it, unless it was done in an open workshop with everybody present. Um, and I, I wouldn't mind giving that a try to see how it goes and to save us an extra 10000 or $8,000, whatever it is. I mean, it seems like all of these districts and every pseudo-government agency I see does nothing but uh, bid out everything that they have to do. Everything that they're responsible for is put out to bid. And I'm just wondering, what, what does everybody do in the meantime? So okay. I'm, I'm in favor of saving the money, and I'm in favor of having a workshop to, to work on this. Uh, so that we can all talk together. No one single person would have the ownership, although it might be typed on Bob's laptop or your laptop, I don't care which. 
but everybody has the equal input and opportunity to provide uh, whatever amount of input they like towards a strategic plan. Okay. Uh, can I go to the audience now and see if there's comments from the audience? Chuck? Whatever process you use, all five of you need to be participating equally in that. Um, facilitation uh, helps organize that in some way. I, I kind of agree, not to try somebody other than Brent. Um, try to come up, but come, do it among yourselves. Don't let one person go, you know, either, you know, you have a lot of experience having done it in the past. Bob has a lot of energy about okay, addressing it. Um, it needs to be done with certainly you two and everybody, you know, everybody else there at the time. Um, and, you know, I have watched I mean, workshops have their problems too. Um, they don't get as much public input as you think they're going to when that happens. I didn't see that happen a lot with the, with the board policy manual. So um, I think it is good to revisit the strategic plan. But you know, if the first workshop doesn't pan out, do another workshop on it. Figure out how to do it. But do it um, in an egalitarian way. Anybody else in the audience? Yes. Oh, okay, Lou. Lou Ferris Felton. 40 years in business has afforded me ample opportunities to participate in strategic planning for everything from small startups to large cap corporations. Review of the strategic plan proposal in the board package has led to several thoughts I wanted to share. While I agree with the definition of strategic planning, namely, and I quote, top level planning document for an organization to, clear, to set clear direction over a rolling five year period, what follows is a document that departs greatly from the norm. Accustomed to a one or two page plan, stressing just a few key aspects of the path that define both direction and boundaries of the future, what the district has in the 2016 revision is a bureaucratic behemoth spanning 67 pages. It has statements on mission, vision, values, as well as a multitude of objectives and accomplishments. There are nine categories in the plan, 27 elements, of detail under the nine categories. Throwing it all together leads one into a confusing morass of information overload. To be clear, I'm not saying that the 2016 revision is totally off the rails. It's just not what I'm accustomed to seeing and clearly off target in some areas. For example, combining strategic with tactical. Normally objectives flow out of the general direction of the strategic plan in the form of operational goals in the beginning of the year. Accomplishment reports follow the end of the year performance with goal by goal performance to plan measurement. These three distinct processes flow one, from to, one to the other in a logical progression, yet they are separate and distinct. For example, general to specific and long range to short term. Wikipedia defines strategic planning as an organization's process of defining its strategy or direction and making decisions on allocating its resources to pursue this strategy. Wikipedia also identifies control and feedback as a key element in successful tr strategic planning. The last indication of action to the 2016 plan was two and a half years ago in the fall of 2016. Has anyone looked at or updated the plan since then? Page 10 outlines one to four goals to be completed by December 31st of each year from 2016 to th 2020. Where can progress to these goals be found? My search of the district website turned up nothing. Lastly, the district paid Mr. Ives $22,000 in 2011 to develop the original plan. We then paid him $8,000 more in 2016 to revise the plan. Now we're proposing to pay him $9,000 more for a second revision. How many times does Mr. Ives have to walk us through the process before we're able to do it ourselves? My experience with strategic planning is holding within the organization since no one knows better how to plan for the future than the ones who have to make it happen. Why not look to the district staff or members of the board for someone with strategic planning experience to shepherd the process? Two specific recommendations I'd like to offer to simplify and improve the process framework toward going forward. Number one, use Peter Drucker's seminal work on management by objectives while he was a professor at Caltech's Graduate School of Business. And number two, keep some parts of the 2016 plan 
that address certain aspects of Michael Porter's work from 1980 on formulating a strategic plan. That is, identifying company strengths and weaknesses, personal values of key in in implementers, industry opportunities and threats, and broader societal expectations. Above all, the strategic plan must include commitment to supplying ratepayers ample water at the highest quality and the lowest price. Keeping this process in-house will lead to a less expensive option, more ownership of the end product, and a better outcome. Questions? Thank you. Anybody else have a comment? Virgil? <clears throat> yeah, Virgil Chan from uh, Brookdale. Um, I think I, I like what I heard from everybody except uh, Director Bruce. Um, the, um, the directors are responsible for the strategic plan. They need to own it. You don't need to hire a consultant in order to fulfill the promise of owning it. Okay, that might be one way to get help. Another way to get help is from staff. But if you don't own it, and you don't do something to say, we own this, it's another 2016, you know, copyright. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Well, I have to agree with what Lou said. When I looked at it, I thought, what's the point of this if we don't look at it every year and say, this is where we are, this is where we are. This wasn't, that didn't happen. So whatever we do, whether we spend money or we work together in a workshop to get this done, we need to be looking at what the plan is, know what the plan is, and have a date certain that we're going to say, this is what we've done, um, this is what our goals were, uh, these are goals we missed, these are goals we made, stuff like that. So. We can all agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. If I may, yes. I'm not disagreeing with you, Virgil. I think we all have to own this. Each one of us has a, has a big part of that. Not having a facilitator of some kind makes that process difficult. I will add, you guys need to get out of the weeds. Your job is not to be in the weeds doing the day to day stuff. You have a professional staff that is more than capable and will be here, were here before you got here, and they will be here after you are out of office, whatever that term is. And that your responsibility is. What are the goals and objectives and emissions of this public agency? And how are we going to get there? Not to write the document, not to do any of that. That is weed work that you should not be partaking in. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Any, anybody else on the board want to say anything? I'm, I'm not prepared to vote for this tonight to approve it. Oh, I, d I didn't hear anybody suggest we vote on it tonight. But. No, it's a possible action. So. Yeah, I know it said so. Uh, Rick, <clears throat> you want to say something? I just don't think staff is the one to write this. I think it's just the board's responsibility. I don't believe staff and the board. I think there's the issues, and the staff will be intimidated by someone from the board. And it should be someone from the outside to work with staff and the board. For input, but I don't think staff should write it. I think this is the board's responsibility. Okay. So, where do we find some outside professional help? Yeah. Well, I, I think you could proceed with Director Fultz's idea, but you need to do it in a meeting from, from A to Z, where all board members are present and you work as a team and not as a yeah, well, I I can go along with that, but <clears throat> it, it, I, I think we can do it. You can you can probably do it. But you need to do it as a team, and you need to have as much public input as we can get, because that's what right. a big part of this. But is. we need okay. input from staff too. Well, you'll get input from staff if you do this as a team. But I don't think one <clears throat> board member should should write the plan, uh, okay. or I don't think staff should take on the plan. We should do it as a team. Yes, you'll get good input. Okay. 
My only con I mean, I agree with the fact that it should be a workshop, which is what I propose. My concern about walking the workshop without something is that in my experience in serving on prayer committees that you don't get anything done. And that if you at least have something that you're starting with, even if you decide ultimately that you want to throw it all out, it's at least a place to start. And so my suggestion was simply that I would be bringing to the board a place we can start. And at that point, decide whether or not we want to use any of it, none of it, all of it, but it's a place to start. Is How that, many is pages does this start? Well, it's probably going to be somewhere between five and eight. That predicated on the 2016 plan that was written? I am... Because, I mean, that, wouldn't that be the place to start in a workshop? To start with what we do have and has been created for us, and let's go through it and throw out the crap, keep the good stuff, and expand well, on that. Basically, the issue that I found with the 2016 plan, it was not a strategic plan. It was a tactical plan. It had specific tasks that were going to be accomplished at certain periods of time. That doesn't give the staff the necessary strategic direction on what we as a board want to see, whatever that may ultimately be. So while it will address, I think, the key topics that are in the 2016 plan, it, the, what I envision is a very different format and a very different uh, content level. It doesn't get down into the measurement of specific tasks with a sliding green bar. It provides staff with the direction that they need in order to be able to then put together those tasks that have to be accomplished and what that period and what that time frame should be. Holly? I just wanted to clarify something. The um, last time Brent Ives worked with us was 2014. I know because it was my very first week on the job and I had to come in on a Saturday and I had no clue what was going on. So it, that was 2014. The 2016 was the, um, the plan that Brian put together by himself and took it to the board. He's the one that had the... the Brian Lee yes. put well, together? Talking with Brett, because I talked mm -hmm. with Brett, I, I, I do believe Brett worked with Brian. Yeah, that may be. I don't know. It was a combination that took to 2016 until we adopted. But, I mean, starting, starting with the, the current strategic plan, whatever the data or anything is, is a great place to start. And we're kind of locked in on, on projects. That's the, the easy ones project. We've got the USDA loan with a multitude of projects. We've got enough going on to where we can outline what's going to happen project-wise uh, over the next few years. That's, that's, that's pretty easy in finance and so forth. It's the philosophy of the board is what we need to get into the new strategic plan because that has changed. Um, and how are we going to move forward? How are we going to move forward on the education? How are we going to move forward on uh, a pest management plan? Uh, we have some philosophies that we need to get to the individual committees. So when we go and put our agendas together for committee meetings and so forth, we're following the lead of the current board. And there's a little bit of a gray area right now, especially for me, to try to figure out which direction to go in on certain certain projects because I, I'm, I'm not sure of the board's philosophy. So it would be good, and I wish this was done right straight out of the box after the election. So we're off and running in the committees. So you can, as a board, give the finance committee what you want to see. You give the environmental, the engineering, what you want to see, and then we take it and run. Um, it's not a capital improvement program. Uh, that's a whole different you know, CIP, this is a lot of philosophy from the board down to staff and with general public uh, input as we move ahead. So uh, I think these, the existing one's a good place to start, and then we just tear it apart from there. I, I, th I think that's a good idea. I think I mean, let's, let's, two cents. Let's, let's do something like scheduling a workshop and have Bob bring what, what you've been working on. Yeah. And use it as a, as a potential framework against the 2016 plan and take the best of both. I don't care if Bob writes the whole thing. I have no issue with, I don't think he's taking ownership of it. I think he's just offering his talents and skills that are going to benefit us and save us $10,000, which I find very commendable. So no, bring, I like that too. So let's bring them both to, let's schedule a, 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 an open sort of workshop type of meeting in some place where we can all fit and get the public involved. Um, and then bring both both documents and, and, and review them. I guess where where one of my concerns 
is how we structure moving this ahead. You know, at what point do we have, you know, the public, you know, a public workshop? Do we go out on, on the road? Do we hold a meeting in Felton or another location and ask the public to come in? That's how we kind of did it before. That's where I kind of don't have how we're going to move this forward in the proper format. That's my weak link to this. And that's where a facilitator would come in, or somebody, or somebody who knows how to do that would come in and help us. And I think it would be good when we have a public workshop with it, inviting the general public in, that we have somebody to field questions and work with the board and, and draw out public questions and then you know, work with us. And that is, is much more reasonable in cost than it would be for the whole program. Right. I, th yeah. I think that's a I think it's a great idea. There has to be facilitators in Santa Cruz County. Well, there is. Santa Cruz County. Mm -hmm. You probably know twenty or thirty right off the top gave, of your head. No, I gave him the names of two folks who didn't respond. Well, so I don't know. to them and and uh, okay. But you know, there's still other facilitators. We used them before. So we used different facilitators. I bet you Tony's a hell of a facilitator, or Anthony, whatever. <laughs> Yeah. You could you could kill two birds with one stone and <laughs> teach us all about you know more more buzzwords. You know? yeah. <laughs> and one of our own committee members might not do a bad job either. I was just going to say if, if you're concerned about the objectivity of the moderator, I would be happy to offer uh, a proposal within two days that will be probably just a, a lunch. That's how much. It, this is not rocket science. The process of strategic planning is not rocket science. Getting it right yes. is hard. That, yeah. So the moderator's That's job the, is easy. It, your job is 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 the hard part. Is is getting out the ideas and then and then prioritizing the ideas. So it, I mean, I think we're really simplifying this here more than it should be, because there's a lot of opinions on this board, although. Three of us pretty much agree um, most of the time, <laughs> but and I know it's frustrating that we have committees, and committees should be because of the strategic plan. That should be, you know, what budget's going to do. Uh, what's engineering's uh, plan? What's what's admin? It's uh, you know, to me, it's a little more complicated than a lunch. But it seems to me, I'm not sure it needs eight pages. I'm not sure. So. Well, how about I? Come back to the meeting this month with an outline, with some type of an organizational plan for to move ahead. And I'll work with directors. Okay. And, and uh, put where together are you, an outline. Where are you going to bring it? Here, back to the board meeting. Oh, back. The oh, board the meeting. next board meeting. Right. For the next, uh, the next board, the second meeting in, in the month. Yeah, that's James's meeting. No, James is the first, but I'm probably going to reschedule that because we have key staff all out on spring break for uh, that first meeting in April. So I'm probably move James to May. Okay. He doesn't know that yet, but <laughs> well, he does now. <laughs> he does now. Everybody's going to Panama Beach. You should have seen his eyes yeah, yeah, like this. He's strong. been working so hard. Uh, I didn't want to tell him, otherwise he'd slow down. But I'll bring back something, and I'll I'll, I'll speak. Um, I'll meet with Bob, and I, I can start putting an outline together and bring something back, and you can all sink your teeth and do it in deep direction. Yeah, I would feel better if we're all more involved from. The beginning. You have to be. You know, that yeah. staff needs your input. Otherwise, we're never going to, it won't work. I need the public's input. Okay. So I'll bring back to the second meeting. All Good right. Idea. We yeah. all agree? I agree. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. The mushroom theory of management later. You've heard of that? Mushrooms? The mushroom theory of management. <laughs> Not the kind you're thinking of, Rick. Yeah, yeah, I know. No, I just no, tried no, to get no, one. You mean how you treat a husband like a mushroom? <laughs> I'm not okay. All right. Um, new business.
uh, rejection of damage claim. Now you want to talk about that I'll one, I'll start it. Um, you all have in front of you a, a damage claim from Nancy Barrick, uh, 14100 Big Mason Way, uh, totaling $516.60 uh, for plumbing damage and a four-month uh, consumption credit. Um, for some time, um, back to October 15, 2018, uh, we have been receiving um, high usage complaints, high bill complaints uh, from this customer. Um, staff has spent uh, an excessive amount of time customer service in field and in the office. Uh, the, uh, myself have dealt uh, with this customer. The finance manager has dealt with this customer. Um, we did a, um, a, a water audit uh, conservation um, visit and examination for this customer. For some time, she has complained of high usage. And we've monitored, we've actually even installed uh, one of the new Badger meters to monitor her water usage. After we installed uh, the new Badger meter, we saw a continuous register of uh, one half to one half uh, gallons per hour, which we consider to be a leak because it continued 24 seven. And the new Badger meters put out graph information that we can get that monitors water usage. Uh, was that the same consumption rate as before the Badger meter was put in? It's, it's fluctuating. It has, the, the, the water usage has fluctuated. Let's get to that. Um, and this all started, you know, with her saying that there's no way that she used that amount of water. Her usage would go up, her usage would go back down, and I'll, I'll let Stephanie can talk more about her usage, because Stephanie did a, uh, an in-depth uh, look at her usage. But we continued to go out and uh, and then there was times that we reported to uh, this customer that she had a leak. She disagreed that there was a leak even when we had uh, with the Badger meter. Finally, uh, let's see, on the date here, I have um, on March 7th, and on, let's see, yeah, on February 25th, she reported to the district that she did find a, a leak. And she further stated that her plumber indicated that the leak was caused by excessive force from district staff uh, on her plumbing when we changed the meter. Yeah. Um, she believes that the, she never had a leak until we changed the meter. And uh, that's when the leak started and it was from the district changing the meter. Um, we disagree. We, just, we believe that she's had a leak either on or off in her intermittent or from some time uh, even way before we changed the meter out. I mean, that was the reason we changed the meter out. Um, she kept calling um, saying that, you know, disputing her bill, saying there's no way she used that amount of water. Um, no matter what we did or what information we provided, she always disagreed with the, um, with the district. Um, for, she always had a reason and believed that it, it was for, um, the leak was caused by district staff. Do uh, you want to add anything in there on that? Um, you can see there's a series of emails back and forth, her usage is in there. I um, believe the district did not uh, create the leak. She had a leak for some time even before we changed the meter and uh, recommending that the board uh, denies the uh, damage plan. So with that, we'll try to answer questions. Um, I, um, I asked you if I could contact her, <clears throat> and I did because I wanted to tell her a dog story. Um, because she kept saying she didn't have a leak. She didn't have a leak. But the meter was saying she had a leak, and she said she had plumber come in and look at her toilet and in the house and stuff. So I sent her an email uh, talking about a neighbor's dog came over to my place, and next thing I know, the dog's <coughs> digging in my yard. And we, we went to check, and it turned out there was water there. I had a leak that I wouldn't have known about until I got my bill, um, because you, you can't see it. It was underground. So I'm, I'm telling her about this, and um, she just, you know, didn't want to hear it, and... 
So I said, all I'm trying to do is to tell you is it can be very difficult to find a leak, especially if it's underground. And our staff know what they're doing, blah, blah. And she, <laughs> she got uh, rather unhappy with me, which is okay. I just dropped out of the conversation. But she's been told she had a leak. And she said, no, 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 no. And all of a sudden, oh, yes, I have a leak. So I, I have a little... Uh, issue with, I, I mean, I realize the public don't understand about leaks uh, and all that sort of stuff, and I, I don't know if she's a young woman, an old woman, or what she is, um, but she just didn't want to hear she had a leak and refused to believe it. That was my experience with her. Yeah, I think from her, I mean, I get the impression from all of the emails she's copied us on that she's a frustrated person. Uh, she, I don't know if she had a leak before. I mean, it sounds like she did have a leak before. <coughs> put in the meter, and then she still had a leak. And then her plumber comes out and says, okay, the pipe's cracked on her side, you know, and it attributes it to the wrenching in of the new meter. Okay. I, I, I don't know. But if her... If she's, has she ever raised, has she been sort of contentious or uh, difficult in the past with any calls regarding other leaks or credit uh, memos that she's requested? I believe we've gone out almost every summer. To, to her? Yeah, for the past three years. And so, and I mean, the, the bill goes up in the summer and then it typically falls down, back down. And so she, this more, more recent one, she had us come out in June and July and her usage stayed pretty high up still in those, in the months after that. Um, and then we did, Brian did approve for her to get a badger meter put in that got put in in October to where we were able to actually have daily visuals of this stuff. Um, I became involved in December and notified her that I'm showing you have a, a leak. Um, so similar though, I mean, it was, it was the emails. I mean, it's, I did not see any, it's hard to say. She said she had other plumbers come out, but there was an active leak. We were letting her know that. We run into this quite a bit. We have someone that says, there's no way I'm using that much water. I had someone check, there's no leak. Put a badger meter on started looking at it with the person. I was like, oh, well, on Tuesday and Friday, you used X amount of gallons. I'm like, well, that's weird. That's the day that my irrigation goes on. Had the person come out again, oh, there was a major blowout in my irrigation that they didn't catch the first time around. I mean, so we get a lot more information with these badger meters. Um, it also is up to the individual to log in and utilize the eye on water and in my opinion, listen to us when we're sitting there saying it's literally showing that you're consistently using X amount of water per hour. There is an active leak. Um, yes, she wouldn't log in, I think it took her about four months so to yes. log in to start using the eye on water. So, I mean, has, it, has she been contentious? I mean, no, I mean, a frustrated when you, re you read the emails. I mean, she's frustrated. I mean, I get it. Um, so, it's, it's kind of hard. To say, I mean, I gave her the tools to be able to log in and look at this stuff, and it took months to get her to finally even log in. You know, I think these situations are probably the most um, frustrating for everybody, right? Customer, district, everybody, um, because leaks are really hard to find, particularly if they aren't really visible. Well, and see, like a it's, 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 it's a shame. So you're using the culprit on right. a lot of this. So I appreciated you putting together the data, and what I did is I lined it up by month, by year, so I'm looking at here. And when you look at, because I look for patterns, I mean, part of what I do in my rest of my life is I look for patterns. <coughs> and when you look at the patterns here, everything is very, very consistent until November 2018, after the meter was put in. That is, the seasonal went up, the seasonal went down. There's no indication of any leak until 
or there's no indication of any leaks at all, even through the summer. She's actually lower than last year. So from a data pattern point of view, it was really weird. I don't know why. Well, that was, was actually her original. The other years, yeah. she stated she had other people living there. Oh, uh, this year she didn't. So, yeah, so that's, what she said. that's what she she called originally complaining about the eights in in June. In May and June. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so maybe she was using a little more water then. I don't know, but the pattern doesn't show it until the meter was put in. And so the question that I I have, and I know this sounds a little bit odd. But are these new meters more sensitive to water flow? That is, is it possible that if that was an old meter, the leak was happening, but it was so slow, it wasn't spinning or it wasn't going through the <coughs> meter problem? You have to spend time. For, that's where our staff, when they check, yeah. you, have to, you have to know how to read the older meters and have to you mark the dial and you have to wait because it is very slow. Okay. For these new meters, you have to pull up the screen and it's, a meter. it's, it's right there. For our staff, Usually, especially if we're going out to check a high bill complaint, or you know, our customer service staff, they do a good no, I, job I understand working, that. and so they should have caught it if it, it was leaking. It, but is it so possible it's slow, that it might, you know, a gallon is pretty slow? Yeah. I mean, kind of what I saw in this, knowing nothing else, is that the Badger meter is just a better meter, and so it picked up a leak that was probably there that we weren't catching with the old meter. But, and so. But even when her reusage goes down. I'm a person alone. She's a person alone. I got a dog who drinks a lot of water. Uh, but I use normally one unit. Mm -hmm. She was using more than one unit and she <coughs> said mm -hmm. that she didn't shower at home. She did her laundry at her boyfriend's. Uh, all of these various things that she said she wasn't doing at her home, yet I shower at home, I uh, do laundry at home, you know, I do the dishes, and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And once in a great while, I go up to two units. I guess it catches up with itself. But I'm pretty consistent, one unit. Well, and that's where, when you look at, you know, from... October 2017 through April, April 2018, she was one, two, and then it goes eight, eight, five, six, four, three, seven, six, eight, seven. So there was something. If, going she, if, if she was by herself. Correct, and that is what her there, statement has been. And we, you know, obviously time. we, you know, we don't know for sure, but if she was by herself, then this would be high. But relative to prior years, it's not, right? It, it, there's no pattern there. And even in October, she was down at three, which was consistent with the last two years. And so it's like, I, you know, I want to make sure that everybody that believes that they have a complaint and they haven't been able to resolve it, if it comes to the board, I want to make sure that people understand that there's a process we go through. We do a, a very diligent job about looking at the data, understanding what's available to us. Right. Um, that process is very important to me. Based on this, I see that there's some leak there, and it was found, and it was in a valve or something. Or I believe it was in our, in our shut off valve. Shut off valve, and that's a in the middle of our yard, or what yeah, is it? probably like ten feet. Ten feet from the meter. Like yeah. yeah. But so she is also it, is, it, is it possible that her claim is true that in the process of changing out the meter, there was violence too much done, torque. too much torque. Let me set the galvanized that, that, pipes in the ground or old or whatever yeah, fragile. It was an old, it's an old service line. Yeah. Um, How plausible though is your claim? No, it's that? not like the pipe cracked. Yeah, a valve. <coughs> that okay. was leaking. <coughs> and okay. ten uh, feet in, you would have enough cover on it to where you, if you're going to break it, or you're going to be right at the first right, foot in. Right. Usually, you know, anything's possible. But our experience is when you're buried way in like that, ten mm -hmm. feet in. There's enough cover on it to where you shouldn't, it's, the force shouldn't have transferred stable. that far in, mm -hmm. especially on that small pipe. Mm -hmm. uh, they're in a meter box, you know, it's, there's a spud wrench they have, there's a rubber gasket, it's not like there's a lot of force mm -hmm. being okay. put, on, put on that meter. Um, you know, and when I do these damage claims, I look and I try to find, make sure. Because the last thing I do, I don't want to claim to come to the board, not unless I'm 100% sure that. 
Um, if I thought that we had any responsibility, I would I would have worked with the customer on the claim. But I don't like claims coming to the board. Um, I don't believe that we caused the leak. But the other thing is, she hasn't given any proof of paying a plumber. Uh, who's the plumber who, there's no receipts. Who, um, who is the plumber that said this, that said the district? Is there, is, I mean, I mean she's gotten so angry. Well, usually when there's a plumber, you meet the plumber out there. Yeah. So we, we go through this and then when people start calling plumbers, we say, we do customer service, we meet the plumber out there, show them what we find. That never happened. There was never any request. No. It was a plumber that she hired under the table and has no receipts. Okay. There's... She has been noticed about the claim. Um, Holly sent the information out to her. She is unable to attend mm -hmm. tonight. Okay. I was going to tell my story from Texas, but I can, I can wait. <laughs> no, no, I had the same exact thing happen to me. <laughs> okay. I, I believe it. Um, Did you want to so, hear my story? So there is a, there is a, she, there is a possibility she'll take this to small claims court. That's correct. And so there will be staff time involved, and I just want to make sure that we're all okay with that. Staff time means cost. It's, it's not a, it's not a, a freebie thing. Although I'm assuming no attorneys, no... Yeah, no attorneys. I usually go down and represent the district. Unfortunately, Santa Cruz County yep. uh, holds their small claims court in Watsonville. Yeah. So it would be Today. Know, the, 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 Today. a better part of the day. Mm -hmm. However, the precedence we set mm -hmm. by sure. just rolling over, we have a lot of people that want to that come forward and say the district has caused damage and so forth. Um, and this has happened to be a smaller... Uh, some of our uh, claims that we get. And we, we you know, try to work with the customers, but I feel that we just, because it's going to be cheaper to, to do the, uh, to take the claim and uh, approve the claim, but I think you'll see more customers coming to the board. Next claim, yeah, time. the next claim may not be so. Yeah. So, and, so, so what that means is we have to be committed to spending yeah. staff time if we want mm -hmm. to stop this claim. But how is she going to win in small claims if she doesn't have any receipts? In my experience, small claims court, that, yes, the, the court wants hard evidence. Um, it's also been my experience that sometimes that uh, the, the court seems to err on the customers. So. Even without receipts? Well, not without receipts. I've never been to small claims court without receipts. But yeah. I know other people who showed up that you sit there all day and listen to the, the small claims cases of the, of the day. The okay. judges said, you don't have receipts, you might as well forget it. Okay. Do we want to hear Steve's I, Texas? I, no, I think, well, the, for the, the sake of saving time, I won't go all into the, the details of it. But basically, I ended up with a, well, we'll go into the details. You've got a small <laughs> plan. So, so I have this house in Texas, and, and I, get, I get my water bill. I go online and I see what my water bill is. And, I check into, I usually pay it, you know, it's like I do here. I go online and click pay and all that. So I went online last January, what, January or February, and I had like an $800 water bill. Oh, and I go, hey, this isn't right. So I call them up, assuming the water company's at fault. And I say, hey, I got this $800 bill. This is not right. I'm not using water. I'm not even there. Nobody's there. And they go, well, you, you must have a leak. I go, uh, I guess I do. I guess, I guess now um, and everything's running through your mind. The house is flooded and all that stuff. So I go, okay, I'm going to send my wife out there. And they sent somebody out to turn off the water. Well, that was great. So my wife gets there, and they come out, and they turn on the water. I fly out there a few days later, and I'm, I'm going through the process with the food coloring, putting drops in your toilet tank mm -hmm. to see if it migrates in. And I go, hey, I've, it, the color's showing up in the bowl. So that, there's my leak, right? Well, that wasn't $800 worth of leaking, you know, as it turns out. I wasn't thinking about that, but I find all my toilets, I have two, they, put, they have both leaks. So I'm run down and I buy the hardware to replace the floats and all that stuff, and it stops the leaking there, and I go, great. So they, they tell me, go out and check your meter and watch your meter and see if it's stopped. Turn everything off in the house and see if the meter's still turning. I go, hey, it's still turning. 
They go, well, you, you still have a leak someplace, you know. I was just glad the house wasn't flooded to begin with when I got there. So I, I go, okay, so I go, so what do we do now? They go, well, you better call yourself a plumber because the leak is on your side, not on our side. I go, okay, since it's your meter that's spinning, right? So I go, that's cool. So I call a plumber. Plumber comes out. He does his magic. He gets his divining rod out, looking around if he can find the leak, which, of course, he can't. And the, the, the ground where I, the, a lot of the ground in Texas is like cement. You can't just dig it up and water won't percolate up. And uh, so I, this is Good Friday now. So I asked the plumber, I go, can you guys find this leak? And he goes, the only way we can do it is to start digging holes from the source and follow the pipe as it goes into the garage where the water softener is in this, the main side. So I go, okay, can you do that? He goes, yeah. He goes, I'll get a couple of guys out. It turns out to be his son and his son's friend with a jackhammer and shovels. And they start jackhammering the dirt all the way. And the story's getting longer now, I know. But they finally dig like 16 holes, right? Well, eight holes from the meter to my garage. And they finally found the, the water. And it's a PVC coupling, and it's leaking. And they go, well, there's the problem. I go, okay, can we fix it now? And so they go, yeah, sure. So they get in there, and they, they cut off the coupling at both ends, put it on a new coupling, and all of a sudden the water's stopped, right? The leak is gone. So I'm looking at the, the pipe, the PVC pipe. It's a, got an elbow on it. No, it's a straight coupling. And... Uh, I start twisting it and it comes apart. It was never glued. And this house is 10 years old. I'm, and I'm thinking, how many other pipes am I gonna find in my front yard that are like that, right? But the, the point is, is I go, okay, I'm really grateful the problem is solved. The leak is fixed. Now I've got this 800 and for the second month I added on another $600, right? The bill that the plumbers gave me was like $1,600 to dig eight holes and come out. You know, Texas is like California. Awesome. Yeah, leak adjustment program? <laughs> so I called them. So I'm talking to the water district. And they, they're, they're really nice. The woman that I'm dealing with is super nice. But she goes, well, she goes, what we can do, and I had my receipts, right? I had all my receipts and stuff and my bills, obviously. And I go, well, what can we do? Because I don't feel like I need to be on the hook for $1,600 to fix my thing, plus the other... Twelve or sixteen, fourteen hundred dollars with the water bill, and um, they're sympathetic, of course, but technically I own the money. It's water that came past through my meter, right? Anyway, what they did was, and what I suggest we kind of think about doing here is a compromise. They they gave me credit, some amount of credit. I didn't get a lot of credit, but I got some. They took back an average of the previous two months, and then said, okay, based on that average, here's what we'll credit you against your water bill for those months in in, uh, in the future, right, since the leak started. And I think I ended up getting like maybe five or six hundred bucks total credit for everything, but it was something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now my question would be, do you think they would have been that helpful if you knew about it and let it continue on for a couple more months? Uh, no, not if I didn't have my water turned off. Yeah. You know? I mean, they were offering to turn the water off and on every time we f came out, right? So that's part of my contention with a little bit about this is I told her she had a leak in December and it took until the end of February for her to finally take action on it. So that, and we do have a leak adjustment program, absolutely, for, for being able to help a combo for certain stuff. So with regards into that stuff, I'm totally fine if someone has a leak that, they're able, that we're able to help get them some sort of credit for it. I mean, you know, Everybody has their own personal issues to deal with, and she may have some logical good reason to why it took her a delayed effort. I mean, her bill wasn't like hundreds and hundreds of dollars, right? Hundred bucks. So she could afford to delay a little bit, find the plumber, the guy that works under the table, instead of charging 80 bucks an hour or whatever they get nowadays, you know? I mean, there's circumstances, right? And I understand she's sort of a, she, she's she's not really behaved the best. She's been very frustrated, I guess, in her in taking it out on staff and everybody else, even you, Lois. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I still think if we offer some form of a, at least appreciate that she's frustrated, offer them something. 
Oh, that right. she feels that. Is it all or nothing with her? Is it's that what she's fault and not her fault, and she never had a leak, and that she wants one hundred percent. So when you go to small claims court, they'll require you to go to mediation first if you can. And my mediation from the district would be the leak adjustment. I would say that we it's a thirty dollar and I think it's roughly a little over thirty dollar adjustment would be for the leak under our uh, leak adjustment policy. So that would be the mediation that I would offer. Uh, and you've already offered that. Um, well, we she wouldn't even get that part. She she said that you know she wants a hundred percent. She doesn't want a leak adjustment. She believes. What is a hundred percent? What she's looking for is it? Wait, my my advice would be not to burn your leak adjustment on this. On this I mean, and that would be the office staff's right. yeah. suggestion as well. I mean, now granted, if she ever did have a catastrophic one, we st you no, still I, end up yeah. getting yeah. even more. But, but still. So, so I think that for me, the bigger issue that comes out of this is an education thing that the district might want to do around older supply line pipes from the meter. And I, I'm not talking about spending huge money here. You know, it's postings and maybe a bill stuff or something mm -hmm. like that. But a lot of houses were built in this area, in, uh, you know, 25 to 30 years ago, 40 years ago. 50. And if, if those 50. if those pipes haven't been changed or touched, and by the way, that included my pipe until about two years ago. Um, if they're galvanized, if they're, you know, old thin wall PVC, whatever, those things are a leak waiting to happen. And um, people ought to be thinking about doing some proactive work on their uh, supply lines if they know that it hasn't been changed uh, recently. And so. we get, you know, you'll see in Stephanie's reports the amount of leak adjustments we give. I can't so. wait for the, the bedroom meter to to get those look, I want to do away with leak adjustments. If you got a bad meter, you shouldn't get leak no, adjustments. No, it's, it's, the leak adjustments are, are increasing quite a bit. And that's but it's because of the infrastructure I think that's aging here is people so getting into the You still have many people that say, Yeah, I think this weekend I'm gonna change out my my water line or my water <laughs> I, I, you know, they just don't do it. I appreciate you that. Do that, that <laughs> but, but I made a I made a lot of money no. as a teenager uh, I know, doing I, that. I, yeah. So um, anyway. I move that we reject the uh, the claim. I will second. Uh, Nancy Burr. Oh, oh, <laughs> sorry, Holly. <laughs> public comment. Yeah. Public comment. Hmm. Public comment. public comment. Oh, public comment out there. Lou. Do we have a tool for um, binding arbitration that we can invoke for a chronic complainer? Because I mean, we, it seems to me we've spent more than she's asking for just in district's time tonight <laughs> talking about this. So from a cost standpoint, you know, and I'm not saying that, that that's, that'll solve the problem, but maybe sometimes if you just threaten binding arbitration because you have it on the books and you can invoke it, they will do that instead of going to small claims court. Just, just a thought. We don't, but the good news is we don't have a lot of customers like this. And we have a few, but we do go the extra mile. And yeah, but like you said, it could be could be because of the, the yeah. crumbling infrastructure in homes. The situation could be getting worse with time. That's true. Why not? Why not have a tool in your box now that you can use when you need it, as opposed to trying to do that when you're besieged with a with a whole bunch of complaint, chronic complaints. I say this is probably one of two since I've been here where, I mean, it, it's on the customer side and there's been a, a lot of pushback. Most times if someone goes out, they have a leak, they find it, they fix it, they apply for a leak adjustment if it is, and you know, they take ownership of maintaining their side of the pipes. That's usually the, the majority of the cases. Yeah. Uh, Lisa, you have a well, let me tell you about mine. <laughs> Wow, he's a changed man. He's, like, he's laughing. Let's talk about leaks. Um, no, it's, it's, I know in the general area where it is, it might have to dig up something enormous. It, it, it got bypassed, and it was on my side. It was a pain. Um, the Badger meeting would help. Um, um, district tried to help. Um, never found it, never going to find it until you know the whole place is bulldozed and you start over on the property or something. So anyway, um, I just thought I'd have to say something. Yeah. <laughs> Stephanie's got a good one too. 
Okay, with that I showed you guys mine where I went on vacation and there's someone used the downstairs toilet and it started leaking. And the badger meter alerted me. I was able to have on-call staff go and shut me off because similar thing. I didn't know if it was the house is flooding. I didn't know what it was and came home, water on, didn't hear anything. But then sure enough, 4 a.m. all of a sudden I heard, we heard the toilet, the little toilet flapper start to go. And yeah. it's amazing how much water Toilet we use. What we should do, we discussed the strategic plan to talk about moving ahead on getting maybe more badgers in above the schedule we're on. Mm -hmm. the, the, the badger meter has been an awesome tool for customer service and our customers. Um, there's nothing like it. You know, so I think that would be something we could talk about maybe spending more money on to bring in additional help instead of district staff to get those changed out. Virgil? Uh, yes, may I ask what the time resolution on the Badger meters is? Every, every hour? Is that so doing? it, well some of them do by 15 minute increments yeah. now. It retains the information and then transmits once daily all of that data via a uh, like a text message. Uh, so I couldn't suspect a leak in my house. If there's a leak, I'll hear it. It's you know thick walls, right? And um, but if I have 15 minutes or even an hour resolution, I can shut off to the va the valve to the house, and I can go out and and then look at the badger meter and go, oh yeah, it stopped. So it must be in the house. You did, well, bifurcating the problem. Any meter, you, you, yeah. all the meters have a, a dial. Ooh, ooh, ooh. The leaking all of them. The difference between the badger meter is it has a continuous graph where you, go, so you back can go back online. in time and look at your usage for. And it's accurate. So I flush much. the toilet it's at 2 a.m. and it pops up yeah. saying that I, I stay away from that. I'm worried about a leak out in the yard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all you have to do is look at your meter. Thank you. Yeah, there's a tattletale dial on there. Oh, you, you. But who right, wants to look at their meter every day? <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> yeah, see, there's spiders in there. <laughs> okay, uh, did we? Okay. Uh, uh, Director Bruce? Yes. Director Swan? Yes. President Henry? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Motion passed. Okay. <laughs> uh, news for the Nancy. Lompico Assessment District Oversight Committee Charter, and Rick yes. Scott, because uh, to, no one's here. Yeah, from the, uh, the chair, Tony Norton, couldn't make it tonight, but she did do a cover memo. Uh, the Lompico Assessment District Oversight Committee held a charter workshop on January 28th. The purpose was to engage the public, gather input, work together to draft a new LADOC charter incorporating recommendations of the grand jury as well as suggestions and ideas from the public. Board members and staff were in attendance. Attached in your packet, you have a draft charter that the, uh, the LADOC committee put together. Um, at, there was some lively discussion and everybody worked uh, uh, as a team and, and a draft was created. Um, it would be, uh, it's recommended that uh, the board review and adopt the uh, LADOC charter. And I, I think one of the charter members was here. I guess she's, she's not, she left. Yeah. So there's nobody here from the LADOC charter. But it was a great discussion. They worked hard on it. Um, uh, their hearts and souls are in this. And it was a pleasure working with them. And, um, Stephanie and I attended the meetings. Uh, there was um, uh, some other folks there. but. Um, it worked out really good and they seem to be very happy with this chart. Okay. I have a quick question on page uh, whatever it is uh, five of eight towards the top of the second paragraph there's a color change in the text vacancy shall be filled and then the within 45 days comma or as soon as possible is in a different color on mine. On, on mine, it's in, oh, yeah, in, in, it in yeah. major grayscale. Mm -hmm. I think it's fixed that it's probably that, that was one of the things that got added so maybe it Okay. Didn't get changed. Didn't know if that was a, a draft version still or a, yeah, a, it is a, yeah. a ghost of something. Well, we it's a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> but that's okay. the way it should be within 45 days or as soon as possible. Okay. Any other questions? No, that's good. That's good. 
Bob? I think this is great. Um, I really like the focus that the, I mean, I went to one meeting, I really like the focus the committee had on, on what they should be doing as opposed to what they should not be doing. Um, I like the fact that there was a diversity of opinion on the, on the Laddock committee to start, that they were able to reach consensus. This really is a model for how we would like these things to go. And uh, thanks to staff for helping um, to guide them through that as well. So I think it's ready to go, and I'm looking forward to getting that first report. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and staff made a, a, a point to just be there to guide and not to, uh, yeah. uh, to try to uh, dictate to them how the chart would be. Mm -hmm. There was a couple areas that were brought up about, you know, contact the legal counsel on that that we talked about and, and, and put our thoughts in. But staff pretty much stayed out of it, and um, they put this together. And they back up to it. Who was their facilitator? A brick? Stephanie? I don't know. They facilitated themselves. Okay. Um, any comments from the public? No comments. So. I move that we uh, accept the. Get this right. Is there a resolution here? Yeah. Well, I, I, I move that we approve the Lompico Assessment District Charter Oversight Committee Charter as documented in our agenda pack. Second. Holly. Second. Director Bruce. Yes. Director Swan. Yes. President Henry. Yes. And Director Pulse. Yes. Okay. Item C. Request for proposal for the district website that we um, send out an RFP. For. All right. Since uh, the district has been online, we've developed and maintained our own website in-house. The website has grown over the years. It maintains a great deal of information and provides a, a gateway for online billing. Requirements uh, regarding government websites have changed over the years, such as requiring websites to be Section 508 compliant, Section, Section 508, an amendment to the United States Workforce Rehabilitation Act of 1973 is a federal law mandating that all electronic and information technology developed, or procured, maintained, or used by government be accessible uh, to people with disabilities. Um, and also, this has such a great deal of information uh, saved uh, in so many different formats, scanning, and it's tough to maneuver around. Um, it's time to to uh, update and upgrade the website. On March 6, 2019, the District Admin Administration Committee reviewed the draft request for proposal and provided comments to staff. The committee voted to recommend that the board move forward with website redesign, development, maintenance, service, and request for proposal. There is an RFP request for proposal draft um, attached uh, for your review and comments. Turn it back over to the board. Okay. Any comments from the board? No. When do you anticipate this going out? Yeah. Do you, that's Tomorrow. Good. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> <Hey. laughs> Anytime now. That yeah. was the right answer. I like that. that. <laughs> And we had a great discussion at admin meeting. I mean, um, a lot of good input. There's a lot of knowledgeable people out there. We're yeah. one of them. <laughs> on websites. I have yeah. about seven companies that I found directly sending this yeah. to as well. You know, people have inquired, and I told them I'll put them on the listing the second it gets approved. So That's I think awesome. we'll have a good uh, turnout. And this will also be part of the plan, I hope, to talk okay. about the website. Uh, comments from the public? No nerd comment? <laughs> Pertaining to this? <laughs> well, Virgil, how do you know she was talking to you? <laughs> Is that how you identify? Are you <laughs> yeah, right. I've been you were true to yourself. I'm not the only person in here with a broken chromosome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, 17 minutes. Was what he 
Pat when he said yeah, you talked that that admin Virgil on spoke on the admin on this subject. Only <laughs> 17. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna we're gonna back out of that one. I, Are we sorry. talking about Sir Nerd? Yes. Oh. I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm no, don't be sorry. Celebrate Pi Day. That's the big question. Yes. Does everyone? Does everyone? Celebrate Pi Day. We think it's great. I I would like to make impressions. Okay. Well, when I stop harassing the public. Sorry, Virgil. I think you apologize. <laughs> okay. I'd like to make a motion that the board uh, accept the attached request for accept the request for proposal for website redesign, development, maintenance services, and authorize staff to send that out to the interested yeah. parties. Do we want to define any of the dates and times where you guys okay making that? Uh, you guys, uh, it's, a, it's a high priority. So. Do I hear yeah. a second? Second. Cool. Director Bruce? Yes. <laughs> Director Swan? Yes. President Henry? Yes. Director Pulse? Yes. Okay. Oh, well, now we have uh, the election of a person for LAFCO. Uh, if any of you who don't know what LAFCO is, um, they uh, arrange boundaries. And if, if you want to have a change in your boundary or things like that, LAFCO are the ones who do that. So, um, you have in front of you uh, on March 6th, the district received a uh, notification from the Santa Cruz LAFCO, a local agency formation commission LAFCO, regarding election for the special district regular member representative. The election will be conducted by mail ballot. The two candidates for the regular member representative are Edward, Edward Banks from Pajaro Valley Public Cemetery District and Rachel Lather from Soquel Creek Water District. Ms. Lather is currently the LAFCO Special District Alternative uh, alternate member. In the event that Ms. Lather is selected as Special District regular member, a separate election will be conducted to fill uh, the, alternate, or the alternate member seat. So you need to direct the chair or do you have to vote for either one of those? Yes. I had a question. It, it said in here that there were three seats open, or three seats available for special districts, but it only mentioned two. Was that a typo? Mm, I doubt that. We're usually pretty good. No, it's... Um, because it, it said here, um, regular member... Hmm. Where did I see that? The independent special districts get three positions on the LAFCO board. The regular member seats are currently held by Jim Anderson, right. who's in our area, with his term ending 2021. Tom LaHue, with his term ending May 6, 2019. And that's the guy who will re replace right. him. And then it says the alternative member seat is held by Rachel uh, Lather. I hope we're pronouncing your name right. Um, I didn't see a third person right. mentioned. I um, believe it's because she's the alternate, right. that since there's a new election coming up, that you have to then... Well, but they'll have to pick a new alternate, it says. No, yeah. No, well, no, but that's if she that's that's wins. Right now, but I don't see three people mentioned. We're just saying the city. It says right here, the independent special districts yeah. get three positions currently held by Tom Anderson and Tom, or Jim Anderson and Tom LaHue. There's not a third person mentioned. Maybe because that's, that's the one that's That's what you're voting for. That's what you're voting for. The third one is open. I thought, so we're not voting to replace Tom. Yes, no, we are. Tom, okay, we're voting to replace Tom. Well, in that case, there's still only two mentioned. Yeah. There's something about um, that there has to be one from a, a different kind of a district, not well, you can't a have, fire district. You can't have another fire member. Yes, Because we have Jim and. But, but there's short one member description. I didn't have time oh, to get okay, it. Background information the candidates as pre Rachel Lather is currently left as special district alternate member. In the event that Ms. Lather is yeah. selected as yeah. the special district regular manager, a separate election will be conducted to fill the alternate. It, no, that's not. That's there's not three it. positions on the LAFCO board, they only mentioned two. And so I was just curious. Apparently, we don't know. Okay. 
So we're so Tom's in terms ending. We need to replace Tom. Okay. At some point, I think he. By the way, I'm very bummed that Mr. McCormick is retiring. I like yes. Patrick a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I certainly hope uh, that uh, his successor, uh, Mr. Serrano, is there 30 years and does as great a job as Patrick yes. McCormick did. And it's just fabulous working with him. I, I, I can make a motion. I don't have a strong preference. Um, I move that we um, vote as a board, vote for Edward Banks of the Pajaro Valley Public Cemetery District to fill the vacancy on Lafco. Uh, may I ask why you're picking him? I think the cemetery district's need representation. Okay. I don't have a problem with that. I like dead people. As long as they don't show up at your door. As long as they don't use water. Well, and then they wouldn't need another election because they'd still have did, an altar. Did, did you second I'll second that. Okay, yeah. so we have a second. By the way. Uh, any comments from the audience? I spent a fair amount of time with Rachel on a trip one time. Um, I had a very favorable impression of her. I don't know how many of you have if I were voting, I'd vote for the person I, I felt I knew was good, and I wouldn't vote for Edward, not because I had anything against him. And you don't know either of them. So that, I'm not expecting that to be enough information. Uh, she's a level-headed person. Um, I don't remember her background I did from that trip. Um, she's, I think she worked for the water the department. The planning department and the sanitation department. Yeah, That's she had a um, good background, and she was just a Okay. Well, I was equally impressed with Mr. Banks's description of his background. He's been active in um, a lot of things, uh, very impressive, and uh, seems to have a great business background, also involved in CERT, which is a very fundamental um, oh, yeah. uh, organization for disaster um, response. Uh, it used to be on Cabrillo College Foundation. I, I mean, it's, it just seems like a really qualified guy as well. Plus, he's a Giants fan. He's a Giants fan, and he plays golf. Yeah. Ooh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Any comments from the audience? No? Okay. But we, we've got a motion and a... Second, right? Yeah. Correct. Director Bruce? Aye. Director Swan? Yes. President Henry? Yes. Director Pulse? Yes. And I'll find out about that third member. Just curious. Okay. So we have a whole bunch of minutes here on the consent agenda. So can we just say okay? Because all the little... Except for the February 21st set of minutes that I have to abstain from because I was absent. Okay. So we need to pull that separately. Then. Actually, you were also absent on January 23rd. Yes. Right, for the special meeting. So they're the first two. I was asleep at the end of the last meeting, and I didn't understand what you were saying, but I do now. <laughs> so, um, so both of those. So we need to deal with those two separately because she abstains? Yes, but unfortunately we do not have a quorum of people that were at that meeting because Mr. Smallman, uh, you, and Director Pulse were the only three that were there. Right. <laughs> so we have to bring that one back again, I guess. Okay. But it, it actually wasn't a real meeting, so I don't know. Yeah, it wasn't no even meetings. really a meeting yeah. because we didn't have a quorum when it started. When it started and we yeah. said we didn't have to have one. It's just a... So we can accept what... Because there's no real minutes. It just says there was a meeting. Yeah. Okay. So I think we can accept that. 
So do we want to separate out then the minutes from February 21st? Is that mm -hmm. and handle that separately? Okay. Okay. Isn't there two sets January 23rd wasn't an actual meeting because there wasn't a form technically. Technically. Well, let's make some motions and get it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would make a motion to approve the consent agenda as posted with the exception of the February 21st meeting. Second. Well, I have a comment before you vote on these minutes as far as approval. It's my recollection that the person who objected to these minutes being approved at the last meeting was our district staff, Gina. So I think we should ask the lawyer who's on the connection whether or not they have any reason to continue to object to these being approved. I think I, I, well, she was she objected when you brought up. Oh, our, because the, there was a typographical error. Yeah, there was a. Mistake. Mistake. Yeah, was yeah, a yeah, she suggested that it not objected. be approved, and I'm just saying, yeah. do we want to ask the lawyer whether or not they they want to step aside for the approval of these minutes? Yeah, they but were the one how's objected. she going to know the answer? But, but I, but it's what, not Gina. Excuse me, wasn't it just that, that's up to you to decide. I'm just bringing up the point that the it was person who objected is Yeah, it was just tonight. a typo. It was a typo to have the wrong it had date. It February 7th instead of 21st. Yeah. yeah. That's on so. 23rd. Yeah. And it was corrected now, so. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Motion and a second. All right. Director Bruce? Aye. Director Swan? Yes. President Henry? Aye. Director Fultz? Yes. Okay. I make a motion that we approve the minutes from the Board of Directors meeting February 23rd. Uh, 21st. 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 I got my dyslexia. Second, anywhere? Second. Okay. Oh, public comment? Any public comment on, I didn't ask about the last one, sorry. Any comment on the minutes? No? Okay. Director Bruce? Abstain? Director Swan? Yes. President Henry? Yes. Director Pulse? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, district reports. Yeah, we have uh, the uh, department status reports in front of you, uh, including uh, the finance and the bill list. Any questions? I have a question on the bill list. I, I have a question on the bill list, too. Yeah. Well, well, what is wine country? Yes, that's the same thing. Five hundred dollars. <laughs> Did we have a party and I didn't go? No you weren't invited. No drinks. You were invited. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't drink. So, what is that? Wine Country Balance, Wine? Annual Service Balance Certificate. I believe it's for, I believe it, I, that's just the name of the company, but I think it's people that can calibrate some of our uh, Nate's lab tunes. So. Right. Ah. They do lab work? They do the yes. Yes. And they they've been drinking wine? Because wineries have yeah. very lots and lots of laboratory of equipment. And yeah. So, okay. There's calibration of a scale. That's okay. I know what would happen if I was doing something and had a glass of wine. <laughs> be a different kind of people. <laughs> it would be totally different. Let's get some and see. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I'm not silly enough, just imagine what I'd be like if I had wine. Any other Billis ones? That was the only thing I saw that... And I wanted to comment on one thing on the uh, district manager's report. The, what do you mean? Uh oh, God, Rick, I was gonna get. Okay, I know, good. I know, you hate this. It's a compliment. It's a compliment. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> so like you had a board of directors meeting subject calendar. This is yet another one of those things going back years and years and years that I've wanted to have. Thank you for teeing well, that up. We're working on it. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say is thank you. 
Okay. So we've a uh, how so we're done with <coughs> administration and finance. Okay, right? Or do you have something you want to say? Okay. So how about James? Operations. What you <laughs> what, what have you got? How many leaks did you stop? Oh, it wasn't that many last month, actually. Yeah. We only had, I think, seven or eight last month. There were plenty of storms going on last month, so it kept us pretty busy running generators around and fueling up generators and checking drainage and making sure the trees were cleaned off the roads. And we had a very busy month with rain mm -hmm. in February, so yeah. it kept our maintenance yeah. staff very busy. Do you play pennies from heaven when you're driving around? Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the treatment staff is just status quo during that time of the, this time of the year. They're running chlorine around. They're doing their sampling, so nothing changes. One. And when everything's so wet, it's hard to see some leaks. So there might be right. leaks out there once. Right. once we've been we've had a lot this month already because it started to dry up the, out these last couple of weeks, and so their the roads are drying out. And when they're wet, we're getting calls now, and we are finding more and more leaks. Okay. Had a pretty good increase in overtime. That yeah, well. that was due to storms and overtime communications, communication wires going down. Mm -hmm. So we had to go out and monitor tank levels mm -hmm. manually. Can't get them back. So turn pumps on and off because we don't have on and off controls when we have power outages in some places. Okay. So yeah, overtime did go up substantially. We tell you run around these areas increased quite a bit on pilots. Well, yep. Those hand in hand lower time. Okay. A any other um, reports here? Environmental's not here. Legal's not here. Well, there's somebody, but okay. Um, committee reports. Future committee items. Well, I know that I'll be meeting with Rick here. Well, I, I hope tomorrow morning. Yeah. There may be a slight adjustment on my schedule. Okay. Uh, we talk about the um, admin and the budget finance um, agendas coming up. Um, uh, we probably, I don't know if Margaret knows, but she was elected uh, chair of the environmental <laughs> committee in absentia. In absentia. I love that. I <laughs> but I just couldn't take a third one. <laughs> so you you were I, 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 You know what? I, 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 I gather that I, I, I know how it works. If you're not there, you get all the action items. So I was running that race. No, you didn't get the action item other than being the chair. <laughs> other than being the chair. And if the chair isn't there, the other person gets. Well, I did do that. Today. Yeah. yeah. You, do fact. But I was, I, I also admit I was, I had it down for 4 o'clock, and fortunately Holly called me to say, get your down here. Um, yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> Very nicely, of course. Um, okay. But we, um, we're going to have a full plate on all of the committees, I think. Yes. Up. There's yeah. a lot of activities that we need to get through. Yeah. Yeah. We had a, an engineering committee meeting uh, earlier this week. It's got it's been such a long week already. Monday. Um, mo Monday. It was a great oh, yeah. meeting. It was a one. We had a wonderful group of, of community members. It was a lively conversation. It was a full agenda. And uh, we've established the regular sessions for when we're going to meet and uh, I'm looking forward to it. One of the highlights of the engineering committee we're moving ahead a uh, engineering committee meeting out of here for the states to do it with the RFP. So that's uh, a milestone. We'll be scheduling that college in the process of scheduling the meeting out there with those folks to release the draft. Um, and we had some great input. There's um, some really good people. I mean, some really, you know, really energized people on the engineering committee. And we also have good public attendance yeah. and good public input. So that's just good. Yeah. We'll be good All righty. Um, how about uh, these minute committee meeting minutes are just to to be noted because obviously we aren't all there. They're they're already posted on the website. Yeah. yeah. So, and there are written communications, and then there's informational material. Any comments there? No. Oh, we also had uh, last week uh, another coffee chat that I will be finding a way to 
bring back the information <coughs> from the coffee chat so the board can see the type of questions and the information, the dialogue back and forth. It was a really great meeting. We had a lot of people attend, about a half dozen, roughly. Mm -hmm. Awesome subjects all the, over yeah. the board. Um, it was the best chat it yet. It was really a, a great chat. And, um, a lot of good things. And I'm, I'll get it into one of the reports or its own report so you can all see what type of questions we're getting. Um, I think you'll be interested in knowing. Is there a general sentiment that you get from the people that are attending? Um, uh, there you go. Big concern in the Santa Margarita, Brown Water Agency, uh, cost to the district, rates are um, a, a big concern. Talked about fish ladder and some of the Fish ladder, aesthetics. some of the projects. It's really a mix. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it talked about it, um, the ways to raise money that the district maybe could go out and use um, the public to look for grants for education. Um, that was talked about for quite a while. It's, it's, a, it's a variety of subjects. Yeah, it was all over the place. Yeah. But they were good substance. I mean, really right. good yeah. Super people. Okay. Next one's what, April 16th? And it's in, uh, in the Rock Rockies, the That's a great day. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you have to shoot yourself over the weekend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so. Um, are there any additions or deletions to the closed session agenda? No. And is there any oral communications about the closed session? Okay. If that's the case, I want to thank you all for being here, and we're going to adjourn to closed session. And you can hang here. We'll be back. Yeah, you can stay here and see if we decide anything. Tara?